Hello everyone, welcome, welcome to this, uh, this month uh, G Wednesday here at the Science Library at the University of Oslo. Um, this is the second G Wednesday this uh, autumn and uh, the background for the uh, G Wednesday this, uh, today is uh, that next year there will be two IODP uh, uh, cruises. And uh, we have got two projects on these cruises. And uh, the two uh, PIs on the cruises, it, uh, on, on a project on these cruises, are Morgan Jones and, uh, and um, Sverre Planke. They're both uh, researchers, or uh, Sverre is a professor at uh, our department, and they're both affiliated to SEED. Uh, I think uh, they can introduce themselves a bit more about scientific background and things like that. So I think I just first give the word to Sverre and then to Morgan. And just a, a small uh, um, information that after the presentation, uh, Sverre and Morgan will be here in the room, but there will be no possibilities for people uh, following it um, online to give uh, uh, questions directly, but uh, so we will not film the the questions that there are you may have to these persons. Yeah. Okay. So, Sweden, floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, um, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure being here. As Britt-Lisa said, my name is Sweden Plumke. I'm a professor at Seed, um, and I'm going to present um, some new exciting uh, cruises or expeditions that we're going to do next year. Uh, trying to understand the volcanism and the climate change during the opening of the Atlantic. It's a topic that I've been working on for since I did my PhD in the uh, late 80s and 90s uh, with Olav Eldholm at the University of Oslo. And I've been more or less continuously uh, involved working with um, uh, deep sea drilling, so with the ocean drilling program and the international ocean drilling program since the time I was a student at, uh, uh, at the department. And it's quite exciting times that the Joyce Resolution is coming back uh, to the Atlantic. The last real cruise it had on the Norwegian margin was in 85, and it was uh, the data from this cruise that I was working with, uh, partly for, for, for my PhD. It's a big vessel, it's about uh, 143 meter long, 62 meters high, it's got a crew of uh, 65 people, and it's got room for additional 60 scientists and technicians. So it's a huge venture. Uh, the vessel's been in operation since uh, 1985. Uh, it can drill in water depth up to 5.7 kilometers, and the total core recovery is about 322 kilometers. So it's a distance from Oslo to, uh, to Bergen that's been drilled over this sort of... Uh, 35-year uh, period. Um, the program now, it, it's called the International Ocean Discovery Program, IODP as an acronym. You can also find often this DSDP acronym for, for, for deep sea boreholes. So that was the, the deep sea drilling project that, that uh, ran from 1968 to 1983. So it's basically been these international ocean discovery programs that's been ongoing since the last uh, 70s, and it really laid the foundation for a lot of the knowledge that we have of deep oceans and plate tectonics and, and, and so on, and, and climate changes in, in, in the past. So it's, um, we've been working for quite a long time to try to write different proposals to get the vessel to come back to the Atlantic. And um, we were successful this time, on, uh, and, and it was sort of scheduled for an expedition next year. So it's called IODP Expedition 396, Mid-Norwegian Continental Margin Magnetism. Basically, we will leave in August from Reykjavik. We'll go and drill, hopefully at nine sites, um, uh, on the Møre and Vøring uh, margins. And then we'll go back to Kristiansand. The vessel is actually owned uh, by a Norwegian company, CM Offshore, that have their head office in Kristiansand. And I will be, I just signed a contract a few weeks ago, 
uh, to be a co chief scientist together with then Christian Bernd at, at Geomar in Kiel and uh, Carlos uh, Sarikian will be the pro uh, staff scientist on this cruise. So we'll be uh, at sea for 60 days. The cost of the cruise is something like 15 million US dollars and then you have the, up, the, the additional cost of doing the science and analysis afterwards. It's not only good weather when you go drilling. I participated in one leg in 95 of Greenland. Uh, it almost sank the ship, basically. We got caught in the storm. If you look at it, how it's described in the, the initial reports, they said that, okay, we had sustained winds of 75 to 78 knots. It's about 40 meters per second. Winds up to 100 knots, so about 50 meters per second. That basically broke down the, the, the weather station, 20 meter plus waves, and we also had the drill string out in the sea. So we're basically keeping the, the, the boat in, in position using the, uh, the thrusters, but the big crisis was really that one of the waves crushed uh, the window on the bridge and hold the bridge and the uh, computer rooms and so on were flooded by water. But Luckily, we had a good crew and uh, we all survived the trip. And for us, it's now certainly it's a good time to come back, do some more drilling, perhaps on a more sheltered area in the Norwegian side of the Northeast Atlantic. So the outline of the talk, I'm going to say something about volcanic rifted margins, data and methods, hypothesis, site selections, and then Morgan's going to move into uh, the climate implications of the magmatism and the onshore drilling. So the sites of mid-Norway, of Nulan, and we also have some onshore sites then on uh, the International Continental Drilling Program in the Limfjord Fjord Island that's called Pivolk. I'm going to collect a lot of samples, so nine boreholes offshore, two boreholes onshore. We'll do byline logging and core log seismic integrations. Um, also the petrophysical <clears throat> logging of the cores, we measure physical properties, do biostratigraphy, organic geochemistry, and organic geochemistry and geochronology. And it basically to address science topics related to mantle dynamics, rifting breakup and plate tectonics, large scale volcanism, paleogeography, paleoceanography, paleoclimate and permanent CO2 sequestration. So it's a hugely integrated project it probably be involved something like uh, up to 50 scientists working on the data from, from these cruises. <clears throat> Just a map that I've often been showing that, that uh, says something about uh, the Northeast Atlantic magmatism. So when Norway and Greenland broke apart about 58 million years ago, we had these episodes of massive breakup volcanism that started prior to breakup at about 62 million years ago and lasted until about 55, 54 million years ago. We find these basaltic deposits along the Norwegian and UK margin, but also on the conjugate uh, uh, Eastern Greenland margin. They're characterized by these very sort of voluminous zebra dipping reflectors, up to six kilometers of basalts, and a magmatic underplates of high velocity body near the base of the crust. In the landward basins, we also find a lot of sill intrusions and hydrothermal vent complexes. <clears throat> and these sort of uh, breakup magmatic complexes have been addressed by several drilling legs before. So in the 70s, uh, we have the DSTP legs on both on the Wöring and, and the Rockall margins. We have the 104 leg on the Wöring and then two legs on the, on the Greenland margin then in the 90s. So is it any need to go back? I think it is. And that's why we wrote the proposals. We got a lot of new data. We have a lot of new methods. We have uh, many new hypotheses. So it's definitely a time for more scientific drilling. So I'm just going to show you something about our new database and, and, and the methods. Um, so this is a map best showing a perspective view towards the, the mid-Norwegian margin. It's a bathymetry. It basically outlines here in white areas where we have very dense 2D seismic coverage. In yellow here, we have huge areas where we have modern 3D seismic data. In addition, we have many seabed samples and, and well data. 
particularly in the inner part here, and potential field data that gives us a very good uh, ways of doing the geophysical characterization and mapping of these parts of the world. This summer, we also collected high resolution seismic data with CAGE at the University of Oslo, but it was run by SEED. So basically collecting 400 kilometers of 2D high res data and two P cable cubes at this what's called the Mudgen Arch and the Mimir High. Uh, and then we do things like sub-bottom profiler, multi-beam echo sounder and gravity coring in, in this part. So two days of weather downtime, this is, is quite reasonable in this part of the world, but we actually had like eight days of data acquisition. <laughs> Then we've been developing a lot of interpretational methods to um, analyze the seismic data. It's what we called seismic volcanostratigraphy. It's uh, a subset of seismic stratigraphy, something uh, we developed in, in, uh, in the 90s. But when also we've been getting access to 3D seismic data, we do this geomorphological analysis and we call it IGNES seismic geomorphology. And then we integrate these interpretations with, with well ties and, and field analogs. And just show one example here from the mid Norwegian margin. So we have these zebra dipping reflector sequences up to six kilometers of basalt can be divided into different sequences. Then it merged into some other type of facies unit, what we call a lava delta and landward flows. And we have a characteristic verting escarpment. We have a, in the Verding Basin, we have a lot of sill intrusions and, and in the flows. So it's different type of um, seismic character that reflects different type of volcanic deposits. And we want to go and drill these type of um, seismic fascist units to understand better what type of volcanics they represent and how they're formed and how they're related to processes in the deep earth. So basically, we're going to drill two holes into the basalts sampling these different fascist units or sequences. <clears throat> we can get these really spectacular images of the, of the subsurface um, geology by using 3D seismic data. So here we just pick the top of the basalt um, and then we do a visualization of this surface and the amplitudes and we can see then beautiful lava flow fields. So these are lavas that have been coming from the west. Flowing to the east, it hits the paleo coastline, and then it goes down these sort of uh, escarpments, kilometer high escarpments, and they deposit it as, as debris flow. So this is made by Adun Groot at Equinor that we've been working with on, on this part. So we have spectacular data, but we also have worked um, a lot on, on different new hypotheses. Here it's just um, um, the seed sort of plume related models where we have a plume generating zone uh, near this uh, large low shear velocity uh, um, units at the core mantle boundary. So hot material is coming up and when it comes to shallow level it melts and it can form these sort of large igneous provinces or, or hotspot tracks. Um, our colleagues at the University of Bergen, Rizke Husmans and, and, and so on, they, they also work a lot on understanding how we generate these large melt volumes. So basically, in, in this model here, uh, if you have a wide margin, the, you can actually generate large melt volumes over a, over a 30 million uh, uh, period. But you can also generate similar large melt volumes by introducing hot material uh, in the asthenosphere. We hope to discriminate between these type of N-member models by, by, by doing by geochemical analysis of trace elements and then also doing modeling of how these trace elements are being distributed. And that is being done by Christian Teiner and our colleagues at the University of Aarhus. So, so basically they developed uh, modeling um, approaches to, to characterize what type of geochemical fingerprints you will have in, in different settings, depending on if you have high temperatures. Um, uh, for instance, the temperature variations will give different uh, ratio between uh, 
between uh, rare earth elements. And in that way, they think they can character characterize the melting temperature of, of these um, um, volcanics that we see on the surface today, and, and therefore say, say distinguish between an adiabatic melting, passive melting, or a plume-related melting scenario. You also work a lot on the sort of the formation of, uh, of uh, the different volcanic facies units. So these, these are sort of end member models for how the seaver dipping um, uh, reflector sequences are formed by continuous seafloor spreading or filling in the rift topography. Um, Olav Eldolm has sort of described it quite nicely in, uh, in, uh, in, in some slides, basically, how do volcanic margin works. And the key thing here is to understand the initiations, the developments of the sin uh, and, and pre and post rift scenarios, and the implications. So the way we look at it, it it's definitely volcanic rifted margins. It's a part of a tectonomagmatic system. And they have large implications in terms of understanding the Earth's interior and environmental uh, impact and extinctions. And this is what Morgan is going to talk about afterwards. But as many of you know, we worked for a long time on trying to link large igneous provinces to major global warming events and mass extinctions in, in Earth history. And a key component here is that magma sometimes intrude sedimentary basins and heat up the host rocks and thereby form uh, greenhouse gases and poisonous gases that can cause extinctions and global warming. Secondary objectives, it's related to understanding the early Eocene hothouse, freshwater incursions in the Atlantic, and then also perhaps how we can store CO2 into basaltic formations. So for us, it's definitely a time for more scientific drilling. Uh, um, there are some references here, a paper by Henrik and co-authors thinking about large igneous provinces. It's a workshop report that explains also the background for it, and it's basically three um, drilling applications that's been developed out from this, this work. So the, the expedition has, has as a goal to test end member hypothesis for the formation of excess magmatism and to uh, understand how this excess magmatism caused the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. So we'll get new constraints on melting conditions, the timing of uh, magmatism, the fluxes in times and space, um, yeah, the environmental implications, and, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the timing of uh, climate events. And Ritzke Husmans was uh, the PI of this uh, proposal. The mid-Norwegian margin is really well suited for doing this type of work because it's very little sediment coverage above the volcanic. So we can reach the, the volcanic rocks and sample it by, by relatively shallow drilling. We've done this type of mapping of the top basalt surface and then the basalt thickness. But perhaps in this case, the most important thing is the depth to the top basalt. And we see here in what we called the Kolga area, the Mimid area, and the Skoll area, that we have sediment thickness that is less than 200 meters. So these uh, basaltic units below the sediments are reachable by the IODP drill string. So schematically, we'll drill some units in the sedimentary basins. We'll drill some of the basalts on the marginal high, and we will drill some of the, these type of uh, units in uh, the oceanic basins and near the continent ocean transitions. Basically, nine primary sites. Um, three of them uh, will sample sediments. Uh, four, six of them will sample mainly basalts. So just a brief summary of what, uh, what the sites will go through. On the Kolga High, in, on the murder margin, we will drill into the basalts, so seabird dipping reflectors, and hopefully through the basalts, and there are also some windows in, in, in the basalt coverage where we sample the pre-breakup uh, or pre-magmatic rocks. On the um, verding marginal high, we'll sample different fascist units, so 
Uh, here it's faulted lava sequences. Here it's an older sequence. If you look at the 3D data, we can see quite nicely here that you have faulted basalts in this part. Here you have a very different uh, uh, morphology. This pitted surface we think is related to magma placed in a wet environment. But it's uh, only based on the seismic uh, data and not on direct sampling. Then we will sample what we call the outer highs. So these are sort of mountains that uh, sits near the continent ocean boundary and represent the timing when the, the, the breakup axis was being submerged to shallow marine conditions and we get explosive eruptions. But this is also a type of fascist unit that never been sampled before. And the final sites we'll go to is out in the uh, Lofoten Basin in a deep marine setting where we have uh, what we call uh, outer seaward dipping reflector sequences representing the early phase of seafloor spreading. So you'll sample the basaltic rocks in, in time and space in, in different, different settings along the margin. So that's my part of the talk. I will now leave it to Morgan to tell us a little bit about the environmental implications of this massive breakup volcanism. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so yeah, I'm going to focus a little bit more on um, the scientific reasonings behind, behind why we want to, uh, to do this drilling. Um, and uh, my background is as a volcanologist, but also um, like an earth system scientist. So how these large volcanic uh, igneous provinces uh, affect climate through time. So I'll focus a little bit more on that. I'm also the PI on the, I, the continental drilling program that will be in Denmark. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Okay, so the time when all this was, was all happening is called the Paleocene-Eocene, and uh, it's representative of the warmest conditions that we have experienced on Earth uh, in the last 60 million years, and therefore is a very good natural analogue for comparing to and understanding and possibly mitigating against uh, the warming that we're beginning to see in the Anthropocene. To give you an idea of how uh, warm it was, so this is what's called the... Um, uh, the hothouse period uh, of the early Paleogene, so that's the Paleocene and Eocene together. Uh, there was no uh, ice caps at either pole. You can see that the Antarctic ice caps started to come in in the Oligocene and the uh, Northern Hemisphere ice caps uh, towards the end of the Miocene. And this scale here uh, is uh, relative global seas uh, surface temperatures compared to today. So that's why it's at zero uh, right now, or just, yep. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so you can see that in the Eocene in particular, we were over 12 degrees warmer uh, on average uh, in terms of global temperatures. But I don't know if you can see, there's a little black line here as well. So that's the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. So on top of this already warm conditions, we have what's called a hyperthermal event when it warmed about four or five degrees on top of that. So we're talking temperatures up to maybe 30 degrees uh, as a global average for surface temperatures. This was a really, really warm period. Um, this occurred around 55.9 million years ago. Uh, it lasted for about 150,000 years, and it's marked in uh, the sedimentary sequences uh, at this time by a, a negative carbon isotope excursion. Uh, what that means is that it's indicative of a very large release of carbon that's quite rich in 12C uh, to the ocean atmosphere system, and that release of carbon uh, resulted in about a four to six degree uh, warming globally, but uh, due to uh, effects of uh, local instabilities, it can be over 10 degrees in se some uh, settings. And the best models that we have is that current estimates of somewhere in the region of 7,000 to maybe even 10,000 gigatons of carbon was released over the entirety of the PTM. So this is a, a huge amount of carbon to have gone to the, to have been released to the atmosphere. And obviously we, we want to understand where that has come from uh, and the feedbacks associated with it. When you look at the PTM in the rock record, uh, what you often get is a very sharp onset phase, uh, suggesting that the, um, the release of carbon was quite dramatic and fast. 
And then we have a body of the CIE, that's carbon isotope excursion, when um, things were fairly stable but very, very warm during the hypothermal. And then eventually we get the recovery phase uh, back to pre-PTM conditions. In deep sea cores, you quite often get um, a burn down of the carbonates uh, due to ocean acidification. So again, this is a good analog for uh, what's about to happen. Uh, and to understand how this may affect the carbon cycle, we really need to start considering what the carbon cycle looks like. So this is a figure that I made um, uh, for a paper in 2016, which takes the pre-industrial uh, values to the best of our knowledge. And the important thing with this is that there's two parts to the carbon cycle. You have this box at the bottom and then all the top boxes. The box at the bottom is what's called the slow carbon cycle and the boxes at the top are the fast carbon cycle. So <clears throat> the way it works is that the boxes on top are all fairly large reservoirs of carbon, but if you see, so that's the reservoir, reservoirs in gigatons of carbon, uh, but then the red numbers are gigatons of carbon per year, numbers fluxes between those reservoirs. So you can see that the, the atmosphere has got, well, it's got more now, but it's got 589 gigatons of carbon in it, but the uh, transfer between that and the surface ocean is each way is about 60 gigatons per year. So it doesn't take very long to completely cycle all of the carbon that was in the atmosphere into the ocean and back again. So what that means is if you end up with some instability in the slow carbon cycle, it, uh, it quite rapidly gets partitioned around the biosphere, the oceans and the atmosphere. So what that means is that if you're going to create a large uh, perturbation to the carbon cycle, like we see during the PTM, then you need a huge amount of carbon released pretty quickly to be able to destabilize this. Importantly though, if you are uh, able to do that or the conditions allow for that to happen, the uh, removal of carbon from the fast to the slow carbon cycle is extremely slow. Uh, it speeds up a tiny bit in response to global warming, but not considerably so that this would um, uh, be, be like much bigger numbers. So what this means is that if we create global warming that is uh, very extreme, it takes on the orders, and orders of tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years to recover from that. Uh, it's also worth bearing in mind that we have different sources um, and they have different chemical signatures. So volcanism generally has a carbon isotopic signature of around minus five per mil, whereas uh, something like fossil fuels, the oil and gas reservoirs, they have um, uh, delta 13C readings of about between minus 20 and minus 45, something like that. So what that means is that if we're looking at a carbon isotope um, signature in the rock record, uh, you'd need a lot less of this uh, than that to create the same isotope excursion. So for the PTM, a lot of people have assumed that it's this because uh, it's easier to explain the data without a huge uh, thing of carbon, but uh, there are several unknowns and this is why we want to test this because we, we know that there's volcanism going on, uh, there's evidence of a meteorite uh, in some American sections uh, and uh, other sources like methane clathrates are obviously going to be very important as well. So this is why we want to understand uh, what's going on. Um, but from the work that we do is that uh, the large igneous provinces, when you look at them in the rock record, so the, these are the ones we know about here, there's a, a coincidence, a, a, a temporal cor correlation uh, between uh, the emplacement of lips and mass extinctions and other climate uh, uh, instabilities, which suggests that there might be a, a causal relationship. And if there is a causal relationship, we need to understand uh, how these lips can drive climate change. And obviously, we're looking at the North Atlantic here, and this is the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. Not one of the biggest uh, mass extinctions, but still quite important. So we have the North Atlantic Igneous Province. Uh, it's uh, closely related to the breakup of the Northeast Atlantic. This is a, a gift that was made by Grace Shepherd, a colleague at SEED. And we have the two sites here. So this is the continental drilling program sites. And then we have the uh, oceanic drilling program sites, much closer to the, the volcanism. Worth pointing out that in the Eocene, uh, it was very different. Remember, we are ice free at both uh, poles, but we also have like the Tethys and uh, some seaways 
uh, that, that make the North Sea slightly different than it is today. So, a little bit more about the North Atlantic. Um, the best estimates that we have in terms of magmatism is that it was about 6 to 10 million cubic kilometers of magma. That is astronomically high. It's really, really big. And 80% of that around uh, came to the surface or shallow crust between 56 and 54 million years ago. It manifested itself as uh, thick lava flows, widespread intrusions. These are the ones in black here. Uh, explosive volcanic centers, these are the dark red, and it's found uh, on both sides of the modern North Atlant Northeast Atlantic Ocean. So this was a very, very large event. Um, the, as Svera mentioned earlier, he Henrik Svensson had this paper in 2004 looking at the, um, the Vöring uh, offshore, and what they found is thousands of um, events in the, in the subsurface where these are coming up from the edges of sills to the paleosurface at the Paleocene-Eocene boundary, and there are absolutely thousands of them. So what, what this means is that you have intrusions of magma into sediments that are rich in oil and uh, other organic material, uh, heating it, and they uh, coming up as explosive events, and they seem to be uh, around the time that we're looking for. More recently, Reynolds et al. looked at the Greenland margin, and they found... Uh, the black dots of the vents that they found. Uh, the seismic coverage on the western uh, side of the rift isn't as good, but there, it's feasible to think that we're seeing this effect on both sides of the, um, of the opening margin. So, in conclusion, we know that they have extensive thermogenic degassing at this time. We can't say for certain when exactly, but it encompasses the time period that we're interested in. Uh, as well, we have evidence that there was a lot of uh, lava uh, eruptions going on at the same time. Uh, there is an, a, a magma chamber in East Greenland called Skergard, uh, and uh, it started to crystallize about 56 million years ago, and the crystals that are um, preserved inside the magma chamber seem to uh, increase in pressure uh, the more late stage uh, crystallization was. So what Larsen and Tyner did in 2006 is that they estimated how much it must have been buried as this magma chamber was crystallizing. And they worked out it's somewhere between five and six kilometers of lava piled up on top of the crust that was above Skergard in this 300 to 400,000 year time period. So five or six kilometers of lava in that time frame is just is enormous. We have a fairly good handle on uh, when this finished because uh, at the top of the lava sequence in Greenland there is a very uh, distinct uh, ash layer called the Grinnell Tuff and it is uh, chemically and petrologically and temporally identical to an ash layer that we see at the surface in Denmark that is clearly after the PTM known as minus 17. So what we have is this 400,000 year time window where we know there's a lot of volcanism going on, but again, we can't constrain it better than that. So just to remind you, the PTM was 55.9 to about 55.75. So it's right in this time window. So we have all of these effects, um, large scale intrusive and extrusive uh, activity across the PTM. So it's plausible to, to say that this was involved in some way uh, in the global warming. Uh, but what we need to test these hypotheses is quality localities close enough to the activity uh, to refine the exact and relative timings of events. Um, so Svera showed this before. This is a figure from um, uh, Mansour's paper. So the idea, the idea for trying to get a site that's close by is that we want uh, sedimentary sequences that both have volcanic and climatic proxies. Quite often the volcanic proxies are limited the further away you go, um, but also sometimes when you're too close they may swamp the signal. So this is why we wanted uh, proximal uh, in the Vöring Basin, but also the ICDP locality in Denmark to see um, what's going on. So. Uh, Svera showed this already, uh, but I just edited it so that you can see the two sites that, we'll be talk uh, that I'll be focusing on for the uh, IODP cruise. We have the Modgen Arch and then the Mir Mir High here. So this is the um, Yan Mayan transfer fault here. So the same um, figure that Svera showed, but just now 
off to the edge, off away from the, the main activity somewhat. So the idea with the Mir Mir High is that we're either going to drill one long continuous core through Paleocene Eocene sediments, or um, do it as a, like a stepwise uh, series of cores uh, to get the, all of the stratigraphy uh, as we go into the deep basin. Uh, for Modgen, we're going to uh, go straight for a hydrothermal vent complex, one of these explosive uh, craters, uh, and try and drill through that to see what, what's inside it and maybe when it occurred, and then uh, have a reference site uh, just off to the side as well. So I'll spend the rest of the time talking about the ICDP, the continental uh, site in North Denmark. This is a cliff face uh, uh, of diatomite, uh, that they, they quarry for cat litter, basically. But you have within these, all these black lines, these are volcanic ash layers from the North Atlantic Igneous province. So every single one of these is a, an explosive eruption that's between 100 and 1,000 cubic kilometers in size that has come at least 700 kilometers to this locality. So this is really unique in the rock record. We're close enough to the North Atlantic to, to record both the volcanic and climatic proxies. Um, I'll go more into this a little bit later, but we have expanded sections, so the sedimentation is very fast, and this means that we can uh, get very high-resolution uh, data, may potentially even annual, but that's, that would be the utopia. And we have these hundreds of ash layers, which means that we can use it for tephrochronology and compare it to the offshore sections. A little bit about the Danish uh, lithostratigraphy. Uh, the two uh, main formations that we're interested in are the Stoliklint clay and the Fur formation. The Stoliklint clay is the clay that was formed uh, and deposited during the PTM itself, uh, but the Fur formation is the one with most of the volcanic ash layers in. Uh, together they can offer very high resolution stratigraphy and they're very thermally immature, so it's possible to use uh, precise organic proxies like Ella Stock has done for a recent uh, paper as part of her PhD. Uh, to give you a little bit more info on where we are, so this is Limfjorden here in northern Denmark, and then we have this small island here called Fur. We have tried to drill on it before, um, but we only managed to get Eocene sediments, so one of the sample localities will be just a little bit to the south, uh, where we uh, expect to have a full uh, sequence. The reason for these hills is that this is the uh, final... Uh, termination of the Scandinavian ice sheet, so basically just bulldozed all the sediments that were in the Skagerrak up a little bit so that they now form uh, hills in northern Denmark. So we get to see uh, the PTM and the post-PTM strata, uh, but unfortunately not the pre-PTM, so we, we need to revisit this and have a, a drill core through. So this is the drilling that we did back in 2016, uh, which was there. Uh, there was also another core that was drilled in 1985 called Hara, but we're going to drill two, uh, one called Fur one, and then another one in Grindrup. So this is the type of drill rigs that we'll be using. Um, this is uh, the, the one that we use, but they, they have several uh, different types, but it'll be this sort of setup, uh, hopefully going down to about 400, maybe 500 meters uh, below surface. So the Grindarup, we have the, the old Hara core, um, which uh, unfortunately is in a very bad state of repair, so we can't say too much using that. So the Grindarup will go through this more expanded uh, sequence just a little bit to the north, and you can see that we get to the PTM boundary at about 400 meters depth. Uh, in the southern part of Fur Island, it's a little bit closer to the surface, more like 170, 200 meters below the surface from our estimates. Uh, so it is possible if we get enough funding uh, to go down maybe to the um, Cretaceous Paleogene boundary uh, where, the, uh, where the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. So that's funding dependent, but it's possible if we, if we can find someone to fund it. Uh, I realize that we have gone through a lot of... Um, of material in quite a short amount of time. So I'll just leave this up in terms of uh, further reading if you're interested. The top left is the 
the drilling report that was for the IODP uh, and ICDP proposals that appeared in scientific drilling. Um, if you want to know more about the, the breakup of the Northeast Atlantic, then uh, Mansour Abdulmalak's paper from 2019 is a very good read. Um, Ella Stocker's paper uh, l using the FUA locality for these organic proxies is now available in EPSL. Uh, and we did some other volcanic proxies in uh, my 2019 paper. So yeah, if you have any uh, desire to learn more about the subject, then please go and read. And thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you very much to both uh, Sverre Planke and uh, Morgan Jones for giving this uh, interesting presentation and background for the next IODP and this uh, on-land uh, drilling. Mm. Uh, it had another name. Continental. Continental, yeah. <laughs> ICP, ICDP, IODP. ICDP, IODP. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much to both of you and thank you everyone for attending here. And thank you ever to all of you that follow online. Um, Sverre and uh, Morgan will be here if any of you would like to ask some questions. But uh, if not, uh, next uh, Geo Wednesday will be in November. And we are so lucky that we have uh, Carmen Gaina that will come here and talk about her research for us. Carmen is a uh, director of uh, SEED, Center of Earth Evolution and Dynamics. So welcome back then. And thank you for now.